Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. And welcome to En Casa con la Plaza Cocina. Every Monday, of course, we have our cooking demonstrations brought to you by the region's best cooks, chefs, restaurateurs, historians from our home to yours. If you're on Zoom, please use the chat feature to let us know where you're viewing from. You could ask questions, make comments. We love to hear from you. Use the Q&A as well. We'll be checking on that. If you're on Facebook, please use the comments section to do the same. Make comments, ask questions. We'd like to hear from you as well. We'd like to thank our February NCASA sponsors, CVS Health, Aetna, Union Pacific Foundation, Kaiser Permanente, California Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. A little bit of an update of La Plaza. We're open every day except Tuesday from noon to 5 p.m. On weekends, we're open from 10 to 5 p.m. La Tienda Gift Store is also open. Though you may be a little bit too late for Valentine's Day, we will be open and you could get your gifts, including artwork, books, CDs, uh, artesanía, and much more there at La Tienda. Alley starts here. Calle Principal, Patriotism and Conflict, Fighting for Country and Comunidad. Frank Romero is going to the 1984 Olympics are all, all on display in our galleries, so come check them out. Last but not least, La Plaza Cocina is has opened as well with the exhibition Maíz, Past, Present, and Future, and to talk a little bit more about that, let's bring up Jimena Martin, the host of En Casa con la Plaza Cocina. Please join us, Jimena. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Happy Valentine's Day, um, the day of love and friendship. Um, yeah, so Cocina opened up last week, our soft opening. So we're open right now, uh, Monday through Fridays from 12 to 5. Please come in and visit the space. Uh, we have a beautiful store as well. As we transition into um, providing cooking classes, which we're waiting for the county to make things safe for our community, then our hours will shift and then we'll be opening on the weekends, uh, providing um, hands-on cooking classes. But today we have our friend, co-curator of the exhibition, La Cocina, uh, con placer. I introduce you to Maite Gomez Rejon, who will be making a beautiful flourless chocolate cake for this day of love y amor. Hey, Maite, how are you? Hey, Jimena, I'm good, how are you? Good, good. So, <laughs> we just jump in? Let's jump in. We got a lot to celebrate. Um, for those who, um, who haven't been to Cocina Space, um, I had the pleasure and the honor uh, to work with Maite. Uh, we co-curated the show. She did all the background writing. I found the, the items, the, um, the objects are in the show. And it's just a, a wonderful collaboration. And through these classes and the past and pop-ups, it's so wonderful to work and such so much knowledge that Maite brings to the table. So with that said, Maite, can you provide us the knowledge of chocolate and love today for our guests? Thank you, Jimena. And yes, if anybody hasn't visited yet, please visit. It was, it was an amazing experience to work with you, Jimena, on this project. And um, I want people to see it. But yes, today is all about chocolate. Um, Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Whether you love Valentine's Day, hate Valentine's Day, celebrate it or, or not, it's the it's Valentine's Day is is here. So what I thought we would do I would do today is um, share a little bit of a history of Valentine's Day and its connection to chocolate and also a little sort of fun chocolate facts. Um, I know I've talked a lot about chocolate in these other programs, but um, I'll just share the, the stories related to love. And then I'm going to make a flourless chocolate cake, a classic flourless chocolate cake that is delicious, it only has four ingredients, which I that always blows me away when something tastes so good and has just limited ingredients. It's just chocolate, flour, butter, and sugar, and that's it. Um, but Valentine's Day. So it's interesting, because I used to always think, oh, Valentine's Day, it's such a cheesy Hallmark holiday, but it actually goes back 
hundreds of years, this whole idea of Valentine's, you know, St. Valentine's, um, it goes all the way to the Roman Empire. And there are lots of different theories as to who St. Valentine was, or before this person was a saint, who Valentine was. Um, but there are a couple of theories that date to the third century. Um, one of them is this, this one, um, uh, Emperor Claudius II, he was very much, you know, against young men being married because single men made the best soldiers. And Valentine was a priest and he thought this to be incredibly unfair. So he would marry young men um, in private. So when it was discovered that he was doing this, of course, he was executed. So that's one story connecting Valentine and love. Another one was around the same time a Valentine was helping free prisoners, uh, Christian prisoners from Roman prisons who were tortured and, and beat. Um, so when, and he fell in love with this young girl, probably the jailer's daughter who would visit him and bring him food. So anyhow, he was caught, he was imprisoned for freeing people and he fell in love with her. And before he was also, he was executed, um, he sent her a letter that was signed from your Valentine. So that is said to be the very first Valentine um, dating to the third century. Years later, now we get to the fifth century. It's the, you know, the, the beginning of the Middle Ages, the rise of Christianity. It's like, okay, how do we connect this myth of Valentine um, or these stories of this Valentine to February. And in February, mid-February was a Roman festival of fertility, the Lupercalia Festival of Fertility. And it, it was mid-February. So in order to Christianize that holiday, which was then thought to be pagan, they attributed to St. Valentine and became St. Valentine's Day. Um, fertility festival, still not associated with love and romance, Although throughout the Middle Ages um, in France and England, February 14th was the beginning of the mating season, of birds mating season. So it was started to be celebrated as this idea of, of mating and love. And the first time we actually see this idea of, of Valentine's Day relating love and romance appears in a British, um, a poem by Chaucer in England in 1375, when he talks about this sort of love and, and mating. Um, and it just became a thing throughout the Middle Ages. On February 14th, people would exchange handwritten love notes. This is before the printing press, people were already exchanging love notes. Um, and it became very popular by the time we get to the 19th century, um, printing is cheap, postage is cheap. Um, so pan, you know, printed mass produced Valentines became very, 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 very popular. So it became a holiday and eventually that made its way to the US also in the 19th century. You know, and these early Valentines, um, early 19th century Valentines, they were, um, some of parts of them were mass produced, but also a lot of them were with, you know, hand cut lace, like paper doilies, and they were just very intricate and very beautiful. Actually, the Huntington Library here in, in Pasadena has an enormous collection of original um, American Valentines, or uh, British Valentines too, but mostly American um, handmade Valentines. They're amazing. But it wasn't until the 19th century, this Victorian era, that a Richard Cadbury from Cad Cadbury's Chocolate, um, he had this brilliant idea to package chocolate, little chocolate bonbons, you know, different chocolates with different fillings like marzipan and cherries and all of these different fillings and package them in little heart-shaped boxes. He called them fancy boxes in a fancy heart-shaped box. And that's the first time that we see chocolate and Valentine's connected, um, which was a very astute marketing move. Um, but chocolate has been associated with love and romance and aphrodisiacs for millennia. Um, and you know, it's one of the most important crops, one of the most significant crops of 
Mesoamerica. Um, I have a chocolate pod right here. And um, in, you know, the Mayans used to celebrate sort of marriages. They had this festival called the Thakha, the Mayans, pre-Hispanic uh, Mayans, um, that was called to, to serve chocolate. And basically when a couple was to be married, the father's, um, the, the groom's father would visit the bride's family and they would exchange a cup of chocolate. So chocolate, you know, chocolate was consumed for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was only a drink and this, and it was something for, it was very, very special, consumed in special occasions. Um, and chocolate basically marked, you know, marriages and, and, and marriage um, mergers and the seeds um, so these are filled with co co cocoa seeds. Um, they're also they're often called cocoa beans, but they're not beans. They're actually seeds. They just kind of look like giant beans. Um, but this was part of cocoa beans were used as currency in Mesoamerica, and this was part of marriage dowries um, in you know pre-colonial marriage dowries. And it was just I have some toasted seeds here. Just I'm, I'm just removing the. The, the little skin of it to get the 100%, just the pure, the pure chocolate right here. Nothing else is in it but chocolate. And this was, it's like the basically, they, they crumble and they're the, the cocoa nibs. This was incredibly nourishing. Um, emperor Moctezuma, the Aztec emperor, was thought to drink 50 cups of chocolate a day. It has, you know, it increased his libido and kept his concubines happy. So there was this association. First of all, it was currency. And second of all, it was a stimulant. It increased libido, um, incurred, you know, dopamine. So it had this association with, with, with sex, with, um, with, and, and, and with endurance. So these ideas, they made their way to Spain and it was treated medicinally. And there are these, you know, crazy stories that the Spanish used hot chocolate. It was still in Spain, only a drink. The Spanish started adding cinnamon to it. Um, in Mesoamerica, it was just very, very bitter chocolate in water with maybe chiles or vanilla, but it was a bitter drink. The Spanish added sugar to it and cinnamon to it, but they used it to aid fertility. And there are stories of women adding menstrual blood to their chocolate to attract the opposite sex, which is crazy. Like, wow, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, um, I wouldn't encourage that at all. Um, but of course it's like, wow, it, it has this, you know, allure. It made its way to Italy. Italians started adding jasmine to it and, and orange peel to it. Um, Casanova, this was famous for his, his womanizing and gambling and all sorts of things. The Italian in the 17th century, he referred to chocolate as the elixir of love. Um, in France, they started adding milk to it and it was just the thing at Versailles. It was the thing to drink. Madame de Pompadour, who was one of um, Louis XV's mistresses, and he had a lot of them, and they all lived in the same place, and they all had to, you know, vie for his for his attention. He had a very, very strong libido, um, and Madame de Pompadour didn't, but she is said to have consumed an enormous quantity of truffles, champagne, and chocolate just to keep up. Um, to keep up. And actually, she would also, in the morning, she would have chocolate with celery, you know, chocolate. I don't know if not a concoct, like one thing with the other um, that was, at, you know, meant to, to rise, to, to keep her, you know, keep her you know, wanting, wanting Louis the 15th. <laughs> Um, but even, you know, uh, Marie Antoinette, she had her own chocolate maker. So it was very much, you know, a, a, a thing. And still, it's just a drink. In the 1700s, the French started adding uh, milk to it. And the English were the ones to prepare the first chocolate bar. But when it came to England, they would also sold it medicinally. They would say that it boosted fertility. This is something that 
came from, from Spain, alleviated indigestion and reverse aging. So how could you not want you know, that reverses aging? And it would, it, was be, it would be sold as a mere lick was thought to make old women young and fresh. It's good marketing, right? <laughs> It's like, it's I'm, I'm ready for my internet's of bonbons and the champagne celery in the morning for breakfast I guess well now we have like celery juice right the green juice a little chocolate on the side of that um but it was interesting like 1662 in England there was a physician named Henry Stubb he wrote this whole thing of the natural history of chocolate and he called chocolate was great um, in, and sexual indulgence. And it was um, Charles II, who was you know, one of these kings of Restoration England, actually the first person to plant a pineapple in, in, um, in England. He is said to, he was the first England, said to have been England's first chocoholic. He is said to, in 1669, he spent 229 pounds on chocolate. Um, as opposed to six pounds on tea. So that's a big difference. And this is, this is England. I mean, they're, they're, they're tea drinkers. So it was all about, it was all about the chocolate. Um, eventually the Quakers were the ones that started this whole sort of coffee, I'm sorry, chocolate industry. They were very temperate um, in their life. They didn't, they, they, they encouraged the, sort of not drinking alcohol and they started opening coffee houses next to pubs so that people would have a, some chocolate drink some chocolate instead of going to drink some you know ale or, or beer and um and then there were all of these advances by the dutch and the swiss and the dutch the quakers were the first to actually make a candy bar um fries and then cadbury's to sell chocolate. By this time, um, chocolate was now much more readily available. It wasn't coming from the Americas. The allure, that allure sort of was lost. A lot of this chocolate was coming from the West Indies. Um, and it was actually sold in, in England as being from you know, the West Indies. It was actually coming from Jamaica. And it was a big part of the transatlantic slave trade. It was chocolate and it was sugar. Not a very sexy love story there at all, um, but the price of chocolate went down, um, you know, because basically because of this, and we start seeing these little different bonbons, different flavors of bonbons, these fancy boxes, and then of course, 1860s, the heart-shaped box um, with little lace doily. And it was great because after the box, you know, you ate the chocolate, you could use your little box to store love letters or, I don't know, buttons, whatever, use tchotchkes, right? Whatever you store in an empty box. Um, but yeah, but, and now luckily, thankfully for them, we have chocolate chips and we can make incredible desserts like we are going to make today. Um, a lot, you know, this, uh, it's fascinating, all the history and back end, but like I say, it comes full circle. Not too long ago, I went to Koba and in one of the shrines, some of the temples, they actually had cocoa beans as a thing of offerings. So those traditions still happen today. I was like, oh my gosh. And the other thing is, um, one of our Encasa series, we did, we went to Oaxaca and they did chocolate from the from scratch. And she was saying is that, you know, the family would get the chocolate, grind it, make these chocolate pods, like, you know, like chocolate discs per se. And they would make these discs. And then if the family member says, let's say her brother was going to get married, they would create these discs today and bring it over as an offering to the new family as a way of sisterhood through chocolate. So not just these traditions and we're not just lost in history, they're still happening today. I love that. And there really is nothing like, I mean, I love chocolate and there really is nothing more special than, than that. I love that, that, you know, the marriage and, oh, I love, I love that. I, that, that it's still alive, that these stories are still alive. Um, I mean, because it is, I mean, it's a fruit. It's just, it's amazing that this comes from the earth and we can make something like, like this. Can you show us how to make this today? I'm so looking forward to it. Yes, yes, yes. So we're making a very classic flourless cho cho chocolate cake with just four ingredients. Um, so what I did 
actually already is I lined um, some cup. The, the recipe says six cupcakes. I got it. I, I lost track of how many I was doing. Um, so this recipe makes six. So melted butter and sugar. So um, you can make it with bittersweet, semi-sweet, dark chocolate. If you're doing a semi-sweet, it's a little bit, or, or milk chocolate, if you like milk chocolate, um, it's a little, semi-sweet is a little sweet. I, I would do um, flour instead of sugar so that it's not super sweet. So I did sugar as if, just like we, you know, butter and flour uh, a mold, I just did sugar. Um, so the little sugar grains, they act, it, you know, it makes the, the, the egg and the, and the chocolate just, you know, climb. Um, so it's just butter, sugar. I'm gonna set this aside for now and I'm gonna preheat the oven to 400 and start melting the chocolate. Um, so I'm gonna melt, I have half a cup of chocolate, uh, chocolate chips. I'm gonna melt these in the microwave. You know, last time when we did the chocolate, I burnt it on the um, double boiler. So um, I'm just gonna do just like 15 to 30 second in thir intervals. Once you burn the chocolate, you, you can't bring it back. So if you have a microwave, go ahead and do that. If you don't, you could get a saucepan with a little bit of water and then set, set it on top and the steam will melt to the bottom of the, of the pot. So I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna do 30 seconds. And I have um, six tablespoons of butter, just six tablespoons of room temperature butter. Once the chocolate is melted, I'm going to add the, um, I'm gonna add the butter to it. Does anybody have any questions about chocolate? Or I have a question. Are you using salted or unsalted butter? And while you're mixing the chocolate there, um, Linda Torres says, Felicidades to the entire team. Love this. Happy San Valentine's Day. May you be granted blessings from St. Valentine's from Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Likewise. That's so nice. Um, I'm actually using... Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and mix it. Even though it looks like they're not melted, the bottom ones are a little bit. I'm gonna go back in. Um, I'm using unsalted butter only because that's what I had, but I think salted butter would give it a nice other dimension. Um, but yeah, I usually use, I usually use, um, I usually use salted. I usually use unsalted butter. Um, and I'm using, Oh, so Elvia's asking, what kind of chocolate? Yes, chocolate chips. I'm just using chocolate chips. Um, I'm using dark chocolate chips for this. You could use milk. Um, I'm sorry, I wouldn't use milk chocolate. Um, unless you love milk chocolate, I don't have nothing against it. But um, you could use bittersweet or semi-sweet uh, chocolate chips. Can you, in case, you know, uh, sometimes you buy the bars, the percentages, if you don't have the chips, let's say you happen to have some chocolate bars, what um, percentages of cacao should we be looking for for this recipe? Well, but I like, so, so basically I have bittersweet chocolate chip is 70% cacao, mm -hmm. semi-sweet is 60%, so it's slightly sweeter. Um, milk is only 10 to 25%. So I, I like, um, I like my dark, my chocolate pretty dark, um, especially with something like this, because it's I line the pan with um, with sugar. I'm gonna add a little, go a little bit more. Um, let's see, Getty uh, Karen is asking, can we use um, cupcake tins? Yes, you could use cupcake. That's what I'm using actually, is cupcake tins. Mm. Yeah. Can we also? Is it possible to use the cupcake liners, or you, you oh. prefer the tins? I would prefer the, I think I would just do the tins only because, because you want to serve it individually uh, with the tins, it's going to look like a, like a cupcake. It would probably work, but I'll just do the cupcake molds. Um, yeah. So here, my chocolate is nice and, um, and melted. If you can see, it's nice and silky and melted. And now I'm just going to keep mixing it. Um, and I'm going to add the butter to this just a little bit at a time about a tablespoon at a time and just until it melts and if the butter isn't sort of melt the chocolate isn't melty enough i'm just going to stick it all back into the microwave 
get it, let it go a little bit, a little bit longer. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and do that just for time. This should work just fine. I'm gonna put this back in there for another few seconds, 10 seconds. And in the meantime, I'm going to, oops, separate my eggs. So I have four eggs. We're using two egg whites and two, um, two egg whites and four yolks. So I'm going to put two egg whites in here and four yolks in here. But I just want to make sure that I don't overdo it with my chocolate. Okay. So you can kind of see that it's melted. Actually, I'm going to flip my camera over to um to show you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so here is the chocolate. This will melt um, as we go. We just want it to be super, 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 super silky and smooth. You could use a whisk. Um, I'm just using a spatula here. Look how good it looks. I just want to stick my whole face in this right now. Okay, so that I'm setting aside. I'll give it another little mix in a little bit. And I'm gonna just separate my eggs. We need two egg whites and two egg yolks. I'm gonna make a French meringue. So I'm gonna put my my um, my whites in this. So do it one at a time. And I'm just gonna use my my clean hands. So I have there's one, two. Any questions, anybody, or comments? No. Any chocolate love stories? Whoops. <laughs> That's two. And I'm just gonna get two extras. I don't need these. These are just make an omelet or something in the morning. Just want the yolks. And this is, Amazing to me that this recipe is just oh, so good. I, mean, I used to make this all the time and then, and then I stopped. Kind of, okay, so there's my yolks and my um, white just are separated. I'm going to wash my hands. I'll be right back. Okay. Our co-host Averado says, uh, chocolate got me through the darkest days of the pandemic. Ah, chocolate is, chocolate is definitely medicinal, right? I mean, I think that, yeah, it has, certainly has, it's, you know, different, it's properties. It's, chocolate has gotten me through a lot of things as well. Yeah, but recipes come in fashion. I'm trying to think like in the late 90s, one of the covers of Bon Appetit was a flourless chocolate cake. It's definitely a 90s, a 90s thing for sure. And then to replicate that, you know, um, first of all, it's flourless. And now we talk about flourless now, you know, be folks being gluten free, yeah. right? So there's no flour in there. But all the different ways to do this, uh, this chocolate cake is somewhat, it's like a, it's just like a souffle-ish. Souffle it's like it's, Yeah, totally. It's definitely like a souffle. So I'm just going to, I added two tablespoons of sugar to this and I'm just going to whisk it. You can see it's really bright yellow. I'm just going to whisk it until it lightens in color. Um, but this recipe, actually, I was in culinary school in 90, 99. And this was, wow, flourless chocolate cake. That's where this recipe is from. from and then and it was just, but it's so interesting now. There's so many people that are gluten free and this and that. This is the perfect, the perfect recipe. For yeah. Them. Once you master this recipe, it's such an easy go to for a dinner party. Yeah. You know. But tell us about your flourless. My my flourless my flourless cake is um, let's see, 
um, this is like early days. I wasn't so fancy. So I would go to the supermarket and get a bag of the, you know, semi-sweet or, you know, chocolates. It was a bag of that. It was six tablespoons sugar, a stick and a half of butter, um, either Kahlua or vanilla. Mm. But you're doing more, you're more technique. You went to culinary school. Mine was just straight up like cheat sheet. Um, my, bro my brother-in-law, he's a chef. And so um, what he told me is like, it was six, it was six eggs. Yeah. So put the six eggs in your blender and put it on blast. Just go, 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 go. Right. And then um, melt the chocolate and the, the butter on the stove, you know, double boiler. And then once it was on blast, the eggs, then um, with the sugar, then you would temper your chocolate. Okay. And slowly mix it in. And then you have, um, instead of individual ones, I would just have one pan. So, you know, line, you know, line it, butter it, and then um, make sure temperate, mix it well, because you don't want the yellow to go in terms of the scrambled eggs, and then pour it in and then bake it. And then you see it rise. Uh, and then once you smell it, then, it, you know, it's time that it's ready, come out. And it was like, it's like, it's my go-to chocolate cake for parties. And then you dress it up with a, a raspberry coulis or some fresh berries or some whipped cream, but it is my cheat sheet go-to. Do you still make it? It's been a while. I think when my daughter was younger, she was all about the chocolate. So I made it quite a bit, but it's so rich too. Mine was like really rich. So a little bit went um, a long way. It's still one of my favorites. It's so good. Me too. Me too. I'm adding, um, I'm just adding chocolate to it. I'm going to add the chocolate butter mixture that we melted. I'm going to add it just a little bit at a time because it's still warm. We don't want to end up with chocolate scrambled eggs, chocolatey scrambled eggs. Um, yeah, I, it, it is such a such a crowd pleaser. And I, you know, I met somebody recently that um, that doesn't look like chocolate. There's some people that just don't like chocolate. Impossible. Possible. <laughs> How? I just don't understand. It's like people that don't like cheese, right? It's like, how? Why? What what went wrong? Um, yeah, your recipe sounds it sounds very I mean, it sounds very similar to this. Same ingredients. Um, I like the Kahlua addition to that, you know. I but like back that. in that that 90s cover, I'm gonna find it. Um that it was one of my favorites. It was like late 90s, Bon Appetit, and they had okay, the chocolate cake a ganache mm. and then it was so, so 90s it had like gold leaf sprinkled <laughs> up on top i love it it's so interesting how some recipes go into you know get popular and are, are, are kind of dated right like what would it be the equivalent now like grain bowls or something i don't know probably the uh, acai bowls or something that's so yeah. now you know then 10 years 15 later are people still going to be eating acai bowls who knows yeah, no. I don't know. I wonder. Who knows? It's so interesting. Okay, so I have all of my chocolate in here. Chocolate and egg, chocolate and yolks, and then I'm going to make a French meringue. I'm just going to set this aside. And I'm actually going to come over to the other side of my kitchen. And the French meringue. So so this is basically my two egg yolks. I'm gonna whip them to stiff peaks, to soft peaks actually. And then I'm gonna slowly add the other two tablespoons of, of sugar until they're uh, just stiff. So I'm just gonna keep it going on low just for a few minutes until it starts just adding some air to the, adding some air to the yolks to make them a little bit Fluffy. And then love this. Basically making a meringue. Like if we were to bake this or add like a little cream of butter or something to it, so we could make just regular okay, meringues. But this is just the, the mousse. The kind of this is what's gonna give it like very make it very, very moussey. Um does anybody have any questions? Can anybody hear me? Maybe you can't even hear me. Because it's so loud. I could hear you. I can hear you. So once this is ready, we're just gonna fold this into um, the chocolate and that's it. And then just bake it for eight minutes. 
the easiest, like you said, the easiest recipe. Last time I'll try putting the, the whole egg in the blender. Seriously, in a pinch? Yeah. In a pinch? And I'm putting it in one rather than the individual. Yes, yes. It's just, you know, you could either, you know, cut it up into slices or do, like I was telling you earlier, just do it family style. Just put yeah. it in there and just everybody go for it. Giving it everybody. Uh, Anna Vasquez is asking uh, the, how much chocolate was used. Um, I used half a cup of chocolate. Half a, half a cup. So it's not a lot. We're only making uh, six. Half a cup of chocolate. So this is very easy to... Very easy to double this recipe. Can you repeat the recipe if they just signed on? They don't have the recipe at hand. Could you be so oh, kind yes, and repeat the ingredients? It's um, half a cup of chocolate. Should I write it down? I could write it down. Oh, sorry, I'll just, or maybe say just, it's half a cup of chocolate melted with six tablespoons of butter, and then two egg yolks that are mixed with two tablespoons of sugar, and then two egg whites here, and I'm whisking to soft peaks. So I'm gonna add two tablespoons of sugar, another two tablespoons of sugar to mix. So let me show you, because we're almost there. And then it's gonna be baked for eight to 10 minutes at 400. So let me just zip this. I'm just gonna go just a, a just a little bit longer, but you see how it left this little thing at the bottom, this like little hook at the bottom. I'm just gonna let it go for another few seconds. Okay. What do you think, Emma? I think this looks good. I think she's ready. Yeah, I think she's ready. Yeah, so it's basically you want it to leave like a little, uh, I think it needs a, just a couple. I'm just going to let it go a few minutes. This will bake pretty quickly. Okay. I think that is good. So I'm just these six pieces, and I'm going to fold this directly into um, directly into the chocolate. You know, it's another nice thing to add on to it besides the Kahlua to add to kind of switch it out a little bit. Um, little cinnamon and a little cayenne pepper. Oh, that's nice. I like so that cayenne pepper. It's like a, a Mexican chocolate cake. Yeah, that sounds delicious. Like an abuelita. Um, chocolate mousse with the cinnamon. So all I'm gonna do now is I'm, I'm gonna add the, the um, meringue to the chocolate a little bit at a time and just fold it in, but we wanna make sure that it's still really, really fluffy. Um, so just gonna 
take this down from the sides and I'm gonna add a little bit at a time and then just fold it in. So it's almost like, it's like 12 o'clock and then you flip it over and you just wanna fold, you don't wanna smash the meringue because this is one what's gonna rise in the oven and give you all of the flavors. You wanna kind of go from the bottom to the sides. I have to confess I'm not really that good at this, but I do my best. So a little bit more. So sort of think about going like 12 o'clock to six o'clock and then flip and then go three o'clock. Just kind of keep flipping making sure you get it from the, the bottom and sides of the bowl, but trying to be super careful to, as to not deflate it. It's okay if you have, you still see some streaks. I'm gonna do two more additions, and then these are gonna go straight in the oven. Oof, this looks so good. I have Holly Lynn Purser says, que rico. <laughs> super rico so good it smells amazing and i didn't and like you said you can add you know, if you're gonna add vanilla to it chocolate to it um cinnamon to it whatever you chile whatever you want to add to it add it to the chocolate before this this process you don't want to add anything but the sugar to the to the eggs to the to the um yolks actually to either egg so You've got this. I'm gonna bring my little chocolate. So let's finish this. And then I'm gonna scoop them into, I'm gonna fill the molds with, the, with this mixture to about half. So again, what I did was butter and sugar. Probably did a few too many, but. Whoops. And any questions or comments? Any love stories? Any chocolate stories? <laughs> no, I think everybody's just awaiting to see the final product. Now, soon, soon, soon. It, it only takes like eight to 10 minutes. Do you remember since we're talking about the 90s? Okay, like the flowerless cake, remember? The other thing that was really happening was the, oh, the volcano cakes. Oh yeah, which one was that? Was that, that was the kind of same thing where was it a... Uh, cake batter but then when it's either you froze it or halfway through you put some more batter in the middle and when you turn it over you cut it open and it just all this hot lava spills out oh yeah that's so funny it's very sex in the city right very 90s <laughs> very 90s I'm dating myself yeah very 90s <laughs> you're dating ourselves okay so this was actually yeah so i can make a few more Just get these three more and put them in the oven. Very French, right? Like the, the, all of that, those recipes are very, um, very, oops, sorry about that. You want to try to keep your mold a little bit neater than I, than I am. Um, very fancy French. A lot of those 90 recipes, very sort of classic French. Now there's more of like a just world influence. So, so many different cultures uh, influenced in the recipes today. All right, so I'm gonna take a paper towel and clean my mess. Because otherwise all of this stuff that's on the sides is just gonna burn. And I don't wanna do that. Okay, that looks pretty good. 
and I'm gonna put them in the oven. Those look pretty even. Stick them in for eight minutes. Okay, I'm gonna check them. My, my oven doesn't only does 10 minutes, but I'll check them in. Try to, I'll try to keep an eye on the clock and check them in eight. Um, let's see, does anybody have any questions or any comments? Um, I'm gonna look for the, look for the recipe and put it in the... I would have to say he was gonna put it in, he's uh, folks who, who have not received the recipe yet. Okay. But he was gonna, he was gonna do that. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. What, how are you gonna serve once those beauties come out of the oven? What are you serving as is, what are you gonna do? I'm going to put them in a bowl here. I have some powdered sugar, some confectioner sugar. So I'm just gonna dust them with the confectioner sugar and just have some fresh raspberries. So uh, if you have, I wish, I was thinking, I wish I had whipped cream. I don't have any, any heavy cream. Otherwise I would make some whipped cream. Um, but this is so decadent that I think just some fresh berries, a little bit of, of, um, of powdered sugar. Sometimes I also really like this um, with vanilla ice cream and just because it's so, it's so rich that, that the ice cream sort of just gives it another layer. Although it's, almost, it's so rich that you probably, you don't really need that much. I, I like that the, the contrast with the fruit and I love the raspberries. It also just looks, the color, um, it just looks so pretty. Uh, but I'll, but just the, the the flavor of the dark chocolate with the with the raspberry, I almost prefer it to to um, to strawberry. You know. Yeah, Maple. raspberries. Um, it's a nice classic twist with a little mint on top. Um, so mint. yes. So if for whatever reason we do not have a chance to eat all of these, or we don't have enough, how long do you think they'll stay outside? Um, I would give it just maybe a, a couple of days. Maybe two days. Now, would you put them in the refrigerator or would you put them in a, in a container? What's the best way to salvage these babies? I would just, you know, I've never, I, I've never had to pay. <laughs> we eat them all. Let's forget it. For yeah. breakfast the next day, midnight snack. Uh, yeah. We have Evelia Perez says, um, happy Valentine's Day, ladies. Maite, your mom's brownies recipe is the best. It has become my go-to brownie recipe. It is a great recipe that that my mom's brownie. Well, then maybe next time we'll bring your mom on. <laughs> I okay, think bring she's your... on actually. She <laughs> said she was going to join. I think she. Oh, was. it's fun. <laughs> and then the other question is: is um, Sigeti Karen has asked, can you freeze them? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I don't know because of the because they're so the because of the mousse. Like they're very moussey, and they really kind of. When you when you put your spoon in, they they're really um, I want to say melt in your mouth, but they really just I don't know if they would freeze well actually. I don't think so because it's you know because what happens when you bake them they yeah. pop like a souffle, and then they kind of fall and it comes with a little crust when as it falls. Yeah. And then even you know I think you kind of lose the um, you lose the because you can't really reheat I mean if you because of the meringue and it's not you know yeah you can't really reheat them because you'll kind of lose that okay, and you want to eat it cold either you want to eat them warm ideally I, warm but they're so good cold is fine too at room yeah, cold, Maybe. Cold, yeah room temperature yeah they're fine but I, I would just leave them you know if you're not going to eat them right away I would just leave them out um or maybe just wrap them individually really well, like wrap them in like saran wrap or something individually. Um, I don't know. I wish I, I don't really have an answer for that. I, I don't think that I would freeze them though. Oh. Yeah, I don't think that I would freeze them. Um, let's see, we have four minutes. No, two minutes, but I think it's gonna, my, my oven's a little long. I'm gonna keep it the, the full 10 minutes, um, but I can already smell them, I already smell. Yeah, so when you smell, it's, it's so great. And it's love when you, you know, when my daughter was little, the through the oven, we put the light on and you could see it grow. Mm. It was like magic. It is magic. I mean, it is this whole idea of like the meringue and the rising and it is sort of magic. I mean, it's, and it's also, I mean, even like like chocolate, there's something, I was reading that the, the taste of 
of chocolate, like the, the, the you know, the, just the cocoa bean, right? The roasted cocoa bean, that the flavor itself is so complex. It has, I don't know how many different flavor, you know, profiles and just, just so many things going on. It's almost just magical. Even the way that it, that it grows. I mean, the, the pod itself, it doesn't grow like most fruit that grows off the branches. This grows from the trunk, which is weird in and of itself. Like the whole thing of how it got to this. And then the, when they're ripe, they're, they're orange or purple. It's like, how did it go from that to this chocolate souffle? We no have a there. question here. So Bonnie, uh, David, David off uh, asked, can I make them now and bake them just before dessert? Yes. If you're going to bake them now, fill them and put them in the refrigerator. Um, and that will just keep the meringue from falling. It's just, that's the thing because we didn't have any stabilizer. There's no cream of tartar or anything in the meringue um, that it will just, it will just deflate and, and it'll just kind of start to get liquidy again. But if you stick them in the refrigerator, they should be okay. What's it's that? like I said, it's like, it's almost like a souffle in a sense that um, when you make a souffle base, whatever flavors you can put it aside and let's say right before when you're ready to do dessert, then whip up your meringues, uh -huh. then put together and then bake. That's true. You could also do that. Exactly. Exactly. And we have here, Catherine says, happy Valentine's Day. And thank you again for the, the presentations. Thank you for joining. And thank happy Valentine's Day to you. Yeah, it was very much, I've been looking forward to this, to this, um, to today, to this talk, to these flourless chocolate cakes that I haven't made. And so, you know, I've served these also. I made them in a class once and we served them with uh, sliced persimmons, like really ripe persimmons. And it was beautiful. I found it. I found it. I was going crazy. The pick the you can see it. It here is the Bon Appetit. Oh, wow. And it's got the gold leaf. <laughs> I was going to ask you, are those almonds? Yeah, that's the gold leaf. It's the gold leaf. Wow, it's the gold leaf. Very, that almost looks 80s. Um, it says 18, 18, 1980, 1999. It had to be in the 90s. Uh -huh. Let's see, it is, because hmm. I'm a crazy lady. I have all my magazines from 1990 to present day. Wow. And I had gourmet magazines till they stopped. Um, printing them and they're like jewels like they, they're like a slice of time you know and recipes come and go in fashion yeah. and that one it just that was my thing to master the flourless cake oh wow i need to bring some over to you, so you wow. see what you think so you could rate them with the <laughs> three of the flour okay Even that would awesome. make a really interesting class right like of the trends you know 80s 70s 80s like, like what what ha what is happening yeah, like sun-dried tomatoes. Sun-dried tomatoes were like the rage. It was on everything. And then now it's like, mm, you know, you don't see it so much. I mean, I don't think sun-dried tomatoes are just like, never really <laughs> understood that. Why? They're, they're like, like they're, just, they're fine. They're okay. Um, let me see. Two more. So we're at eight minutes now. Let me just take a peek. They have risen. Well, I really want them to kind of crack in the middle. So I'm just going to give them... Just another couple of minutes. I found it. January 1999. Oh, 99. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's when I was in culinary school. So that would make sense. Mm -hmm. They were trying to be, you know, be fancy. Be bon appetit. Be bon appetit. Yeah, no, it's like, you know, it's like, a, you know, with a dinner party, it's just like, here it is. And then, okay, once you got the cake, okay. Then it was, okay, the ganache to make the ganache, you know, and um, I cook, but not really like cooked in my own kitchen, you know, that freedom of experimenting and seeing how things come out. So it was always like that year was a challenge of flowerless cake. The ch yeah, I, it's, it's awesome. What, what, what's your favorite dessert now? Do you have a favorite like chocolate or otherwise? I think the flowerless chocolate cake, anything with chocolate. Same, anything. Are you serving anything tonight? Are you doing any? Anything? No, no, no. Last night was celebrated. Um, and tonight is just relax. Maybe watch some Academy nominated films. Oh, yeah. we watched Luca last night. So cute, the cartoon. The sweetest, cutest thing I've ever seen. Okay, um, there's some good ones. That was, that was 
10 minutes. Um, so we could see how some of them have really risen, but they're not quite, I want them to crack. I know we're kind of running out of time though. So they ideally want them to crack on the top, that you sort of get kind of shiny and crack on the top. Um, let, me, let me pull one out just to kind of get a... <coughs> So I'm gonna. I'm just, just, just for for time. I'm gonna stick these back in for a couple more minutes. My oven is a little runs a little warm. Um, where's my? Just um, I'm just gonna put this and then serve some. Um, that's basically what I do. With these little raspberries. It looks like my plate is a little bit too big. But there's a beauty hall. Oh, actually, let me flip this over. Well, we still need you to hold them so we can take a photograph for oh, yeah, the yeah, Forever yeah. Life on Facebook and for, on YouTube. Yes. There's a, maybe I put too many berries on now. Never. I always good to have I enough have berries. Berry. Uh, yeah, I'll hold it up and then I'll, and then I want to taste it for everybody. Um, okay, let me grab a spoon. And hold it up. Oh, let's see, Karen. What shape mold would you use in making like a like a, a ramekin? That's what I would use. Yeah, a ramekin. So like a six cup, a four cup mat, six cup of ramekin. Is that what you use, Kimena, when you make the big the big cake? Um, I use an eight inch. Um, eight inch high. Okay. A No, I use actually cake pan. Oh, cake pan. Okay. Eight inch cake pan. Okay. Okay, so let's say yeah. say Valentine's. Valentine's. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's taste this. So you see, can see how how dark it is, how dense. Didn't really. It's kind of flattened a little bit. I don't know why it flattened so much. Maybe I, maybe I maybe my meringue dropped when I was. I said I'm not so good at it, but it's more of like a tortilla than a mousse. But it's delicious. It's delicious. Our friend oh. colleague um, Sarah says, "Ooh, get uno." Mm-hmm. It's delicious. Oh my God. And then the little the sugar on the side, it just has this delicious um texture. This is really good. Well, thank, thank you for sharing. Uh, first of all, the thank beautiful you. history of, of Valentine's, where that all came from, and the cards and chocolates and the combination, and how wonderful it is besides um to celebrate love and friendship. El Dia de la el amor y la amistad. And with that, um, I wish I was there to celebrate La Moria Amistad, your dear friend, dear colleague. And again, thank you for sharing those great stories, a sweet, easy recipe that folks can replicate and master at home. Hopefully have enough time today to make it today for the loved ones, or maybe next week or over the weekend, or we have a dinner party. Mm -hmm. Super easy and super yummy. De nuevo, mil gracias. Happy Valentine's yeah. Day. You too, thank you. Y con eso, uh, mi compañero, Averaldo. Tell you. Thank you so much, Maite and Jimena. That looks super delicious. And uh, mm -hmm. we got to try it ourselves. I mean, the recipe seems simple enough. It just takes a little bit of, of muscle power to whip it up if you don't have a, a, a mixer there or a blender. And uh, I have an oven and I have the muffin pan, so I'm set. So we have uh, Bonnie Davidoff uh, saying, as always, so fun and yummy. And we agree. Uh, Getty Karen, thank you, Maite, with a little heart there. <laughs> And uh, on Facebook, uh, of course, Sarah Portnoy, Feliz Dia de San Valentin. So Feliz Dia de San Valentin to everybody who joined us tonight or this afternoon on En Casa con la Plaza. If you didn't catch the entire episode, if you want to watch it again, we will be, we recorded it. We will be posting it on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA, where you could catch all of En Casa con la Plaza Cocinas, all 50, 60, who knows how many, but they're all there including uh, this one and then the one coming up. We're taking off next week, so don't come and visit us next week because uh, it's President's Day. We have the day off. I know, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But we will be uh, here the week after, which is the 28th of, uh, of February at 3 p.m. con carne en su jugo with L Laura Cruz of, uh, of her uh, home-based firm called Del Alma. So that sounds delicious. So that'll be on uh, for, uh, Monday, February 28th. 
But in the meantime, you could come and visit us at La Plaza Cocina. We're open Monday through Friday, 12 to 5. We're at 550 Spring Street, right behind La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, behind the, where the stage is, right there in Spring. You could park at La Plaza Village, or you could park in our parking lot at 171 Arcadia. And the museum is free. But bring some cash or, or your debit card because we have a nice little tiendita where you could buy some, some really nice uh, items for cooking, as well as some cookbooks. All right, so thanks to our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, Aetna, uh, Union Pacific Foundation, uh, California Humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Uh, YouTube, of course, at La Plaza LA, catch all of our uh, In Casa Con, Con La Plaza Cocinas, as well as our Facebook page and on our website, lapca.org, uh, for all the events coming up, both virtual and Starting next week, we uh, we return on campus with a documentary screening of uh, Ruben Salazar, Man in the Middle, at 7 o'clock there at La Plaza. So looking forward to meeting, seeing a lot of you in persona, finally. All right. So thank you again, Maite. Thank you so much. Jimena, we'll see you soon. We'll see you tomorrow morning. We'll see the both of you tomorrow morning. All of you that are out there. <laughs> We're waiting remember. for confirmations. Yeah. No, we just got it. We just got it. So, oh, great. So 5 a.m. That's going to be fun. Uh, Telemundo 52 doing live uh, uh, broadcasting from, in casa, uh, from La Plaza Cocina to your home. So if you're up at 5 in the morning and at 6 in the morning, we'll be on the newscast on Telemundo 52's <laughs> newscast. And you'll see Maite and Jimena talking about La Plaza Cocina and the exhibit that's on, on display right now, Maiz, Past, Present, and Future. So with that, muchas gracias a todos. Que tengan buenas tardes. And we'll see you soon. And happy Dia de San Valentin to all of you. Mwah. All right, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>